<laughs> what a joy. And Jill, oh my goodness. Danita from Southern Indiana. Diane, I know, is from Beaver Falls. Very good. Very good. So you have made it. I'm so proud of you guys. It, uh, this is, has been such a passion project for me for five whole years, just carrying this and wondering when it would be time to share it. I've been learning. I've been leading small groups. I've been doing this work with uh, spiritual directees. Uh, but this is the first time I'm getting to bring it to a larger group and to learn from you. And that's my hope this year, that in doing this together, we'll not only grow close to God, oh my goodness, that's my hope. Learning to abide deeper, to go home faster, to learn how to receive our comfort, our bread uh, from our Good Shepherd but also to learn from you about how these tools work for you so that I can in turn uh, teach them to other people. So you guys are my pilot group. You guys are the group who is going to be helping me to continue to teach, to deepen this practice, uh, to deepen this work. I'm sure some of your questions will send me back uh, to the books, learning more. Uh, will send me to my knees asking the Lord, what is it that we need today? And that's what I'm doing these days. I'm waking up at like 5 a.m. every morning and um, asking the Lord, Lord, what is it that you have for us today? Uh, and I know that is just going to be deepening over the next uh, couple months. I'm not usually such an early riser. I just... I uh, know that I need that time of quiet, and since I've got kids at home, that homeschool, I'm in desperate need for that quiet. So it's such an incredible privilege. Once again, when you come on, go ahead and say where you're from and wave. I'm so excited. Hi, Tammy from Arkansas. Such beautiful people. What a treat. Oh my goodness. So go ahead and type in what your desire is for the Presence Project. There are quite a few of us are on Facebook, but some of us are not. Some of us are not on Facebook. We, uh, people have opted out of Facebook, which I totally get. I understand the need for more quiet, um, more time uh, set aside uh, without so much visual and chaotic noise. So I totally get that. Um, but so there are some people on here who are not in Facebook, but I'd love to hear you say where you're from as well and feel like you're a part of this beautiful community. So I am going to um, share a little bit about who I am first. I'm an ordained Anglican clergy, and uh, together with my husband, we spent 10 years doing a Priscilla and Aquila ministry on the uh, lake on Lake Michigan. Um, I'm a certified spiritual director. I'm an inner healing minister with 12 years of experience and trained by Healing Care Ministries International. I'm a writer. Writing is how I think. Writing is how I learn. I'm a homeschool mom, and I believe that that vocation is extremely important. Just the vocation of motherhood, no matter how you end up schooling your kids. Um, but my oldest two are homeschooled. My youngest gets on a bus every morning and skips. He's so excited to see so many kids. I am uh, also in love with my high school sweetheart of 23 years. Um, and here's a couple things you may not know about me. One is that I have one eyebrow with a cowlick that makes me look like the spawn of Spock if I don't pencil it in. You should have seen my second grade school picture. That was special. A second, I am a car dancer convinced that one of my jobs as a mother is to completely embarrass my teens. And I crank Rachel 
Platin's fight song and dance wildly, although my nine-year-old, I must admit, has better dance moves than I have. So we are, that's a little bit about me. And I am going to find my PowerPoint. So here we are, the Presence Project Community Gathering. Let's see, here we go. So here we are, everybody is welcome at this table. The Presence Project is comprised of just a few things. One is a monthly community gathering and this particular uh, event will be much more um, much more of my talking uh, after this they'll probably last only about an hour and a half and they'll be much more in the retreat model so we'll have much more time for quiet much more time for listening this one we just have a lot of information to get through so bear with me with that um, so one community gathering in one simple spiritual practice a month uh, my life is busy, your life is busy, but I have a sense that the Holy Spirit wants to enter in with us to our ordinary life, our everyday life. So if we can find practices that for the most part kind of weave in and out of our life, but bring us more and more awareness of God's presence, of his care, of his uh, love for us, then we can begin to rest in him throughout all of our life. So that's the idea behind this. Third, there's Facebook encouragement and community tips. Uh, there are emails, so there'll be a weekly email, which is kind of a synthesis of that week's work. Uh, support. We're gonna be supporting each other on Facebook, and I ask you to try to find or to ask the Lord Jesus Christ for a flesh and blood person. Who is that going to be? Sometimes we don't know, and we just kind of hold it out to the Lord. Lord, who would you like to walk through this year with me? And I'm positive that the Lord will show you. Uh, and then I'm also asking, I'm providing this absolutely free, but I would love um, if you would work with me to develop the stories that come out of this year for you, to, um, to think through how the Lord is using these practices to deepen your abiding in Christ. But I want it to be absolute low stress journaling. Everybody take a deep breath with me. So some of you are just natural journalers, uh, and I invite you to send those journals to me every month at the right before the beginning of the next month's practice is revealed or is, um, is taught. So go ahead and send that to me. Um, and send it to mtrsummer at gmail.com. Uh, some people are just list makers. This is how I felt today. This is where I was grateful for that practice. This is what worked for me. This is what didn't. This is uh, when my ordinary life in that practice came together. Um, third, you can always just debrief using the questions on Facebook. You don't have to keep a journal on your own. Uh, every week I'll have specific questions uh, that you can write your answers to and that's your journal as we go. Um, some of you are artists and you will, instead of writing words, you'll collage, you'll paint, you'll write poetry, maybe even create a Pinterest board or memes or that type of thing. Is meme or mem? I never know how to say it. Um, and then there's always going to be a weekly link for face on Facebook for bloggers or Instagrammers, because that could be a way, if you Instagram, you could uh, do hashtag the presence project and then all of a sudden, 
uh, you have an instant uh, journal and you can paste that link into the weekly sharing thread. So I'll have that come up on Friday, that weekly sharing thread. I want you to know that this, all of this work uh, was developed by so many people and um, I'm the beneficiary of all of their work. So Terry Wardle from Healing Care Ministries uh, has been an incredible teacher for me. And I invite you to go on to his podcast, Slingstones, and listen there. I think you're going to find it really compatible to the work that we're doing here. The person who works with him, uh, one of the people that's worked with him, Dr. Ann Halley, um, she has done a lot of work in attachment with spiritual direction. And I've learned so much from her in my spiritual direction certificate program. Dr. Kurt Thompson wrote uh, this amazing book, Anatomy of the Soul. Jim Wilder has some wonderful work on prayer and connection with God in neuroscience. Dr. Sue Johnson works with attachment theory in marriage and She's also written some chapters on attachment theory in our relationship with God. And then so many of these people have learned from Dr. Daniel Siegel, who's a neuroscientist. One of the joys of this past couple months has been uh, listening to and hearing the stories of parents of adopted children. As you'll hear, I think there's a whole lot of links for our work here and their work with their older children, the things that are needing to happen in that child's brain and the things that need to happen in our brain as we attach to our Abba Father. And then my inner healing small groups, uh, beautiful, beautiful people who have done this work with me for quite a long time and um, in which I have done most of these practices with, as well as spiritual directees. I wanted to give you the opportunity to hear about this week's, or this uh, next couple weeks practice. It's just a simple breath prayer. As I was praying, a couple people asked me, so what practice are we going to be doing this particular month? And honestly, I had thought we were going to be starting in February. But as they asked, I thought, of course, we want to start with something right away, a simple practice. So I prayed and I did some study and this is what I came up with because it's actually practice I've been doing quite a bit over the last couple months. Essentially what you're going to be doing is taking a breath in and then breathing out even longer than your inhale. This does something powerful in our brain. It's like, it's like flipping a switch. Um, essentially, in our nervous system, we've got a teeter-totter. And uh, it's called the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system. The inhale is like stepping on the gas. It's full speed ahead. And the exhale literally flips the switch so that we are coming into more of a um, sense of rest. And if we can connect this with a breath prayer, with a scripture that is very simple or just a very simple prayer, this will enable us to connect our very breath are moments when we need to still and get still before the Lord. Moments when we just need to receive a moment of rest and peace. If we can connect that to communion with God, to prayer, then automatically rest and prayer are going to become intermingled. That is the hope. 
So go ahead and try it with me. Uh, I, I invite you to learn about the Jesus Prayer, which has been used for thousands of years. Um, use the Jesus Prayer. Uh, learn about the Jesus Prayer. It is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So the Hesychists, um, way back in the 500s, three to 500s, they were Eastern Orthodox. They would use this breath prayer in order to still themselves before God. We're just going to be doing this three to five times to start um, with that shorter inhale of like three counts, three or four counts, and that longer exhale of six or seven. You can find out more on the Facebook Live and um, see um, what, um, yeah, find out more on the Facebook Live and uh, that, that I did. I did a couple and one of them with my mom, one of them by myself in which I explain this breath prayer with much more scripture behind it. Um, in him we live and move and have our being. If breath is the ground of our being, then breathing, if everything in our life is supposed to connect us to communion with God, that is our deep hope, right? Then even our breath can be connected to communion. So these are some possibilities. One is, the Lord is my shepherd. Go ahead and look at these. And see if there might be one that connects with you. Hmm. Diane, she said, my therapist uses this rhythmic breathing, diaphragmic breathing, when we're going through rough stuff. I now connect it with Jesus and with breath prayer. That's beautiful. So go ahead and ask the Lord if he has one for you, even if I uh, try one of these out, or maybe there's another. I'm using be still and know that I am God. Let's spend a moment in quiet, taking about three to five deep breaths. Again, Lord Jesus Christ, you are here with each one of us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are doing this work already and in inviting us to lean into you and your work. 
we place ourselves in your hands. We cannot do this on our own, but only by your invitation, only by your transformation. So come, we give you access to us, every area of our life. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Teach us. Open up our awareness to your presence today. And Abba, would you show us how much you love us? Thank you, Lord. You lead this time. This is yours. We are yours. And you are all we desire. And Lord, all our other desires that are in the wrong places, we pray that part of this year that you would be redirecting us straight to you in your kingdom life. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now go ahead and take a couple more deep breaths. Put your hands up on your lap and say to the Lord, Lord, what will you have for me today? I'm open. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. So this is your practice, dear friends. What a, what a precious gift to pray with you, even across the miles, knowing that you are dotted all over the place. Such, such a precious moment for me. So this is your practice over the next three weeks. Until we get together in February again. So in February on um, Thursday the 7th at 1 or 7, we'll get together. Uh, and until then, you'll be doing breath prayers. If, if I were you, um, I would even set a little alarm on your phone to go off every couple hours. Or maybe when you just need a break when you get up from your desk at work that's when you would take your three to five breaths if i were you i would think about when you're going to schedule that um not to be a to-do to list but as a moment of quiet a moment of rest uh, that you can count on is going to be there where you are going to be able to receive your daily bread in that moment. So moving to um, February, I'm going to ask you to buy two candles in clear jars. I'm gonna show you nine. I got these from Target. And um, I just invite you to find like I said, a candle in a clear jar so that you can see the flicker of the flame throughout the day. Uh, and choose your scent carefully because you're going to be living with it uh, for an entire month. And then also, when you leave the house, find a small object. Uh, maybe even ask the Lord, what is it should I, that I should put in my pocket? 
when I'm leaving the house to remind me of you, to remind me that you are present with me. So this is mine. Um, it's called a clinging cross. This is so special, you guys. It's ergonomically correct and molds to your hand. It's out of resin, um, but it fits right into your hand so that I set it in my coat pocket every once in a while, or like in a skirt pocket or something like that. And every once in a while, I'll hold on and remember, yes, Lord, you are here. That's what we're going to be practicing in February. So those two things, find candles, and uh, you can get these off of Amazon, the clinging cross, or perhaps just a rock with a word on it. Uh, the Lord, um, ask the Lord, and I think he'll show you over time what it is that you should carry with you. And again, our next community gathering, put that on your calendar, Sunday the 3rd in Atlanta, here where I am, and Thursday the 7th online at 1 or at 7, just like we are today. We're doing a 1 to 3 um, and 7 to 9 we're going to be doing that again every month uh, with that time period. And then as you have time, join the Facebook group or find a group of people around you. Um, you can sign into Facebook today. Everybody is sharing a little bit about who they are and, um, and why they're doing the Presence Project. It's just Oh my gosh, it's the most delightful thing to see all of your faces, can I even tell you. So today's agenda, I know you can see all the pieces, uh, but, it, but it also means that I see the little picture and I can go back and forth to the Zoom and it makes me feel less stressed. So I'm sorry it's not quite as pretty, um, but that's, uh, it'll make me feel better. So the agenda today, we're going to be talking about my story and then God's story of longing for us. We're going to be talking about the questions that the Presence Project fulfills. Uh, and after that, uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Excuse me, I know you all were wondering <laughs> when our break was going to come, but it's going to be at that time. And then we're going to be talking about attachment theory and adoption and why uh, these practices can help us as adopted children of our Ava to attach securely to him in order to have an earned secure attachment to feel safe and secure wherever we go. Um, and I'm hoping we can do the breath prayer practice throughout um, and I am going to create a Facebook thread so that afterwards you can debrief with me I'm not very good at going back and forth yet to see everybody's comments so I'm sorry about that this is a huge stretch for me and it's a, a wonderful gift to be able to do um, but uh, yeah, anyways, I couldn't add one more thing of trying to figure out how to go back and forth to comments. So I apologize about that. Hopefully I will, I will figure it out over time. Once again, let's take a couple deep breaths. Take that particular scripture with you. This time, listen to your body and see where you're carrying your stress. And offer that story to the Lord as you breathe out.
And one more deep breath. Thank you, Jesus. So 10 years ago, I could have never done this. My anxiety would have been way too strong. A fear of rejection was my constant companion. So my anxiety story starts from uh, a full U-Haul uh, from Maine to Ohio, a 16-hour trip. And I came with my preppy clothes and with my, um, my Eastern accent. I said aunt instead of aunt. And um, I was completely positive that I was a reincarnation of, of Anne of Green Gables. I am not joking about this. And we will not talk about the problems in theology or the trouble grasping reality <laughs> with that. Um, but for four years in my new school, we had moved into a tiny um, Christian, a tiny Christian school uh, that I went to. And for four years, from fifth grade to eighth grade, I was bullied. Um, the town was lovely. Now that I think back on it and I have children, I just think, what a beautiful place to raise children, honestly. Uh, most of the children were cousins of one type or, or another. The parents would go to Calvin College and, and get married and come back and, um, and work the farms, these beautiful big farms with muck, with this thick uh, black dirt. Uh, and the kids were so strong. They were so... Um, yeah, they were, they were so strong. They were actually working side by side with the migrant workers in their parents' field. But for four years, I was teased and picked on and called names. So for four years, I was loved at home. But as soon as I opened the door to that metal, that metal door into that school, it was like I was a different person. Um, I was unable to hold on to the truth of who I was as soon as I was in that space. The deep chasm of rejection cut into my brain, a chasm in which all other thoughts ran into. I know you know what that's like. The neural pathways that were developed during those four years became the circuitry for, with which I saw the world. What we know today about brain science is the first three years in a baby's life is the brain is uh, being created, um, being developed in hypergrowth. Well, the years between nine and 14 is the same way. Those adolescent years are uh, powerful years for brain growth. But the strange part was that I also had sugar issues during that time. And my, um, my fear of rejection became linked to the blood sugar ups and downs that I lived with. So I lived with anxiety. I lived with depression, embarrassment, self-loathing, uh, like I said, rejection. And I would cut off relationships out of self-preservation. And in fact, two weeks out of every month, even into my 30s, I struggled with intense desires for isolation. Through years of inner healing and teaching inner healing, small groups, the Lord began healing one layer of my heart after another, peeling aside pain like layers of an onion. And one of the big ways that I was healed was by basking in the love of my Abba. Spending time in his truth, practicing his presence, drawing near, knowing that 
he was for me, that he was good. All of these things became a major puzzle piece to my healing. And slowly he rewrote the wiring of my brain to hold the truth that I'm a beloved child of God. So practicing the presence of God has become the pathway to peace. And I'm slowly recognizing that peace is not just a thing, he is a person. We all have stories of brokenness and healing, and we're all somewhere on this journey. And I want you to know through my telling my story that I understand brokenness and that you are safe here with your real story. It's okay to be where you are on your journey. It's okay to accept that and um, to hold it up to the Lord and allow him to speak into that place and to, to, to lead you right there. One of the words that um, I've gotten out of the work with Terry Wardle is that you can't have a real relationship with a mask. So I just invite you to come fully how you are. We've all been there. We've all struggled. We've all fought hard battles. I have a picture of my daughter here because uh, she, my mom told me uh, not too long ago, she said, you know how full of light Madeline is? How full of confidence and joy she is? Mom said that um, that's how you were at her age before you moved uh, to this farming town. I'm so proud of her. Once again, I'm going to invite you to do the breath prayer. Take a deep breath in. Exhale out longer than the inhale. Ask the Lord, Lord, would you give me an awareness of your presence with me right now? I want to share a little bit with you about God's longing for us. This is something we don't talk about very often, but is all through scripture. So all through history, God's eye has been set with abiding in and dwelling with his people. Whenever you see something spread from Genesis literally to the end of Revelation, you can be a hundred percent positive that this is deep in the core of God's character. So I'm going to start at Genesis and I am just going to touch down just a few times to show you and then over the next couple months we'll fill it out some more. So at creation, God made us for himself and invited I love this concept, inviting Adam and Eve to walk with him in the cool of the evening. Have you ever thought about that? How intimate, how lovely, how much it sounded like he was just inviting them for their evening walk. I wonder if they would walk through the garden and God would point out a pomegranate that was growing and getting ripe or point out the flaming crep myrtle. And even when 
Eve chose self-trust over God-trust. God still came close. He even, this is one of those stories that you kind of pass over, but when you look at it, when you stare at it, when you look at it, all the pieces, facets of the prism, it just becomes more and more lovely. Even after she sinned and they're being kicked out of the garden, what does God do? He doesn't flee away from them. Again, even in their sinfulness, he comes close. And what he does is he kills an animal. He makes clothes for them out of mercy for them because the Middle Eastern sun would harm their skin. So even at a, the point of their greatest sin, God still drew near to care for his people. God led the people of Israel by his presence at a distance with a fire by night and cloud by day, and he was in front of the people. But that wasn't enough. He called Moses a friend, and he spoke to him face to face, and his presence was with one person, but he wanted to be with all the people. It wasn't enough. He had the Israelites build a tabernacle, a tent that could be taken down and moved, and now, as he filled that tabernacle, he was beside the people, but it still wasn't enough. He invited Solomon to build a temple. And you know the story. As the kabod glory of God fell into that temple, it was so heavy that the priest fell to the ground. Now he was contained inside a building, yet he still wanted more. The presence came then in the form of a body of our Jesus. He walked our dusty streets, the Emmanuel, the God with us. And when he died, that cross, his two arms out, became a bridge for us to draw close, a permanent way to the Father. And yet, he still wanted more. He sent the Holy Spirit to be within us. And yet he still wants more. We're in the already and the not yet. In Revelation 21, in the ESV, it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And in the message, I love this translation of this scripture. It says, look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. They are his people and he is their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And friends, isn't that our hunger? Isn't that our desire to have God move into the neighborhood, to have him accessible, to have him um, so close, abiding with us, dwelling with us. We have been brainwashed by the brokenness of the world to believe that his love could not possibly be that kind, that tender, that compassionate, that persevering, that forgiving, that steadfast, that unconditional, that absolutely delightful.
at this moment, I just invite you to hold out your hands and to pray, Lord Jesus, in the next few days, would you show me how much you love me? Go ahead. And while I had God safely encased in a to-do list, my morning prayer list, my Sunday morning church time, he was knocking, inviting, longing, wanting to do all of life with me, not just be put within an hour's time in my morning. He wanted to be a part of my everyday, ordinary moments. So friend, our God, he is quick to forgive and moved with compassion, ready to roll up his sleeves and get dirty in the muck of our lives, and always delighted when you walk into the room. You, my friend, hold a unique place in the heart of God. That's why you were created, because he longed for deep, abiding communion with you. And this is a heart of he who is knocking at the other side of the door. Because Revelation 3.20, that's not a salvation verse. Those verses are for Christians. I stand at the door and knock. So he is longing. He's already knocking. He's already inviting. It's we who have the blockades. We who struggle. And yet, as Brennan Manning had said, Jesus would rather die than live without you. So he has already issued the invitation, a costly invitation, and now it is our turn. Here's one of the focus of our work. Imperfect human love has so marred our brains and our ability to receive love that we need God to rewire our brains, one truth after another, one powerful interaction with God after another. Here are our questions. How do we overcome chronic anxiety and make our home in the love of God? Second, how do we root and establish in the love of God so that God's love becomes a powerful hiding place within the storms of life. And third, how do we learn to abide and attach to God so securely so that everything else flows from that place of knowing we are God's beloved? By approaching, building the muscle of abiding and resting in God through the triple lenses of attachment theory, neuroscience, and simple repeatable spiritual practices, we can begin to tear down the blockages and lay the foundation for a life fully rooted, safe, and secure in God's love. I 
am wondering uh, what it is that's connecting with you. I'm, I have my chat box open. I figured it out. Uh, what it is that's connecting with you the most out of what I've shared so far. And then after this short debrief, uh, we're going to have a 10 minute break. Go ahead and type. Okay, Susan says, I'm being healed by basking in the arms of Abba. Ginger said, all of this is connecting with me. I had a similar experience to you in elementary school, which led me to a poor choice in a first marriage. Oh gosh, I understand that. I had a horrible first boyfriend. Uh, who was abusive because of um, being so open and desiring of, of attention. I totally understand. Who else? What's connecting with you? Danita says, it's a little frightening asking God to show me how much he loves me. I want it, but wonder what that will be like. That's completely fair. And Diva said, when you explained how God went through the multiple steps of drawing near to us, it just clicked. Oh, that's so good. Diane said, I can connect to your story, being bullied in school, bad first boyfriend, needing the love of God, needing to be loved, needy and needing to be loved, 100%. Josie said, I love the reminder that he is always with us, looking for us, longing for us. I've struggled with rejection issues. So this is a continuation of some spiritual direction I've received along these themes of attachment and rewiring our minds in Christ. And Catherine said, I agree with Danita. I feel afraid to ask. Hmm. Cheryl said, the desperation of neediness for love, this touches my heart deeply. I daily often feel desperate for love. Oh. I so hear you. Mm. And Catherine, I just suggest you talk to the Lord about that too, that you say, I'm afraid to ask you. Um, and it, it, that's fully appropriate to bring that up and out before him and say, I need to be able to trust you. I need to know that you are good. I need to know that um, you will answer me. You know, when I ask for uh, bread, you won't give me a stone, for sure. And Diane said, many attachment issues in my life, how wonderful God is that he can heal and be our Abba and that he is real. And Catherine said, I look forward to using the breathing prayer when unexpected things come up. As when I respond too quickly, oh man, do I hear you. Yeah, to, to breathe first before we respond. Yep. That's a good word, I know. That's a really good word. You guys are doing such good work. 
Susan said, breath prayer first thing in the morning because I always feel heaviest then. And Deb Carr says, I feel unconditionally loved by God, but still struggle to know how to respond to untrustworthy people, reflecting his love without receiving the lies of the enemy. Ah, oh, 100%. Elaine says, I notice the great kindness of God is his pursuit of my heart. You pursue me? Wow, so astounding. God has rewired my child heart to trust your father heart. So different from my earthly dad's heart. But still, there are shadows that need rewiring into your bright light. Oh, beautiful. And Linda said, I have to go, but this has been so good. See you later, Linda. You can get the rest of it on the Facebook page or um, whatever you need. A friend said, this has been so affirming, reinforces what God has been doing in my life. I'm so blessed with the marvelous spiritual director. Slowly, I feel myself letting go of anxieties as I continue to grow. Slowly, that is, yep, that is the operative word, isn't it? Yeah, and Diva said, Using this as a breath prayer in the next few days. Show me how much you love me. Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys are doing magnificent work. It is such a privilege to, to I know we're not in the same room, but, but we are in our spirits. Our, um, I can tell the Lord is just really doing a beautiful work through the Holy Spirit, and it's such a privilege to uh, be a part of this, a small part of this. I'm going to invite us to take a 10-minute break, uh, and at 2.10, we'll come back and start up again. See you in a moment.
Well, you have a minute. Um, what is your um, what's your drink of choice? To have? Um, are you drinking a cup of coffee or some tea? This is what my husband calls cream of lawnmower. <laughs> it's a protein shake with a little avocado and berries and kale and whatever. I think it's delicious. What are you guys drinking? Mm. Yummy, Josie. Vanilla Frappuccino, that sounds amazing. Big glass of water and some M&Ms. Yes, please. Sparkling water and lemon. I have uh, fallen in love with sparkling water with a, just a dash of something at the end of the evening. That's my favorite go-to. This is chai tea, the Tazo chai tea with a little bit of milk. We have a couple more minutes, about four more minutes. What, what's everybody reading these days? Any good books? My, uh, one of my best friends who's at Denver Seminary right now gave this one to me. I believe it's a Romanian uh, pottery, something like that. Diane said, um, I just finished The Beekeeper's Apprentice and another book by the same author, Love to Read Mystery. So how is The Beekeeper's Apprentice? Was it good? Oh, a picture of flourishing, I agree. How fun, okay. Good to know, I love to know good books. Any other good book recommendations? You guys are too fun. Cheryl is reading The Year of Our Lord, 1943. Huh, interesting. 
Yes, I am going, going to look at the questions one more time in just a moment. Yep. Oh, and I'll put it up right now. Cheryl said, can you put the questions up again? I'd like to copy them. And Ginger is reading Educated by Tara Westover. Everybody's talking about it. How is it, Ginger? Very interesting, huh? In what way? Interesting can be a good word. It can be a word sometimes that I use, like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> Susan is reading Everyday Genesis, inviting God to recreate you. There's a reword, one of Susan's favorite types of words, by Nika Maples. That looks great. Woohoo! Diane's reading, Nurturing Your Writing Calm. Mmm, that sounds lovely. All right, it's 10 after. So I am going to get started again. And here are our questions again. How do we overcome chronic anxiety and make our home in the love of God? How do we root and establish in the love of God so that God's love becomes a powerful hiding place within the storms of life? And how do we learn to abide and attach to God so securely so that everything else flows from that place of knowing that we are God's beloved? So by approaching building the muscle of abiding and resting in God, through the triple lenses of attachment theory, neuroscience, and simple, repeatable, and we're going to talk about, and buildable spiritual practices, we can begin to tear down the blockages and lay the foundation for a life fully rooted, safe and secure in God's love. So God created our brain. None of this is new to him. In fact, science is just catching up with the truth that Paul proclaimed in Romans 12, didn't he? He was talking about the renewing of the mind. But uh, neuroscientists didn't uh, allow for that fact until around 20 years ago. They named it neuroplasticity or that the brain is changeable, it is moldable. But they did not accept it, whereas Paul did way back in Romans 12. The heavens declare the glory of God, but so does our created body. The heavens declare the glory of God, but so does our cardiovascular system with that miraculous machine called the heart in its 100 thousand miles of veins, arteries, and capillaries in every adult person. The heavens declare the glory of God, and so does our brain. And in understanding our brains better, perhaps we can get to know what our creator had in mind, no pun intended, when he created such intricate systems. The hope is that then we can participate with him in walking towards greater communion and abiding with him. We need simple, repeatable, and powerful tools to develop a strong bond with God. 
We need to get good at running home for comfort on the good days so that on the bad days we can find our way home to our Prince of Peace. So the premise of all of this is not new. You heard earlier who my teachers were. And this is not a disclaimer, but deep thanksgiving for all of their work, that all of their work has laid a foundation for this particular work. So for the past 10 years, I've been doing inner healing ministry, but have found many were not even able to go into the deeper places of pain for healing until they had a more secure attachment with God. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute. But I began to include many of these practices that we'll do here. They had to come to a place of trusting God before they could be reconnected with that much pain. Totally understandable. And of course, these practices are the ones I use most often to draw close and allow God to reshape my own brain. Again, how do we build strong neural pathways on the good days so that on the bad days we'll be rooted when the hurricane comes? Again, through simple, repeatable spiritual practices. It's so important to realize that this is not a formula, but it's a relationship. What we are hoping to do um, is to, um, to travel home to his comfort, to his bread, to his heart, so often that it becomes a well-worn path so that on the bad days, and I mean a path in our brain, literally a neural pathway, so that on the bad days, we travel that knowing where our bread comes from. Does that make sense? So we're going to return home over and over, making a well-beaten path. So the repetition is not um, false repetition. Uh, it's, it's not false prayer. It's literally retraining our brain to, um, to point to north. Again, this is not a formula, but a relationship. It's a positioning ourselves over and over in the vine. It's a pulling up to the table over and over to receive his bread. It's a reorienting our map again with a compass to true north one moment after another. And there's um, historically the monastics had the liturgy of the hours in which five times a day they would return to worship to set their hearts again straight towards God, towards desiring him and not desiring all these other places. Andy Baker um, said, I'm going down to the third one, transformation. He just wrote this in a blog post, but I was so struck by it. Transformation is the result of repeated submission over time. Again, this is not a quick fix. Roots take time to grow. Americans, we are addicted to the quick fix. We incessantly search, even our constant strolling is a scrolling, is a search for one aha moment after another. We are spiritual fast food consumers, zigzagging from one guru to another, one church after another, one Sunday morning high after another. When true, lasting internal change, the rewiring of our brain in order to uh, receive from our Abba bread, not going all these other places for bread, it's slow, deep work. It takes time to grow vegetables from seed. Gestation takes time. Malcolm Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to develop a skill. 
And I looked it up. My dad's a surgeon. It takes about 24 to 26 years of schooling for a surgeon to become an expert. Good things take time. There's a reason why Paul used the metaphor of rooting and establishing in Ephesians 3. When I took those, um, those woody branches out of the ground from the front of my uh, yellow cottage in South Haven, Michigan, when I took those out, uh, these little branches that had uh, come up, I'm not thinking of the right word, <laughs> and transplanted them to the backyard. What the gardening book said was um, to keep it trimmed so that it did not bloom on the first year because the roots were too important. And then it said to continue to keep it trimmed for three long years because the root system was so important to root and establish deeply, it would take that amount of time. Rooting and establishing in God's love is slow work. But I need you again to hear this, and I keep saying this on Facebook. We are in partnership with a God who is the prime mover, who is the initiator, the one inviting us deeper as one of the people, I think it was Jill Wandell, I could be wrong, I'm, and I might even be saying her name wrong, um, but she, I believe she's a Methodist. She said, it's prevenient grace. The Holy Spirit is already guiding. Jesus is already knocking. We are just opening the door through our participation in this work. What will transform us from the matchstick girl to the one who knows that she is an adopted heir of God? I wonder if um, there are any uh, questions that you have before we move on. Oops. Do you have any questions before we move on? Okay, I'm realizing that it's possible you haven't been seeing my, my, um, my share here. We'll see. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm gonna check someone's chat to see if you've been seeing. Okay, so Susan's been seeing it. I've seen the slides. Oh, good, I'm so glad to do that. Okay, here we are. Okay, thanks guys, I appreciate it. So simple, repeatable spiritual practices, not a formula, but a growing relationship. It takes time for us to remember where we can find bread. So what will transform us from the matchstick girl to the one who knows that she is an adopted child of God? Secure attachment to our Abba Father. And I'll explain to you what I mean. So uh, when you see a child on the playground who's securely attached to their parent, you see them running around, but looking back occasionally. You know that feeling, uh, watching your kid looking back and is mom watching? Is mom there? Am I secure? Is what they're asking. They're also asking things like, does she still delight in me? Does she still care about me? 
And then when he gets hurt, I'm remembering Xavier do this because I was I was learning about this around the time that Xavier was four, and uh, we were on the playground, and he kept looking back with joy, wanting to catch my eye. But then he stumbled and fell and scraped his knee, and he ran to me for comfort. And that is a sign of a securely attached child. And that is what we are hoping for in our own brains. So attachment theory, I'm just going to glance over it. Next week, I'll do a longer um, teaching on it on Facebook Live. I'll probably push it up to YouTube and then send it to our, um, our group by email as well so everyone can get it. Essentially, attachment theory is the idea that a child needs to create a secure relationship with a caregiver in the first three years of their life. So um, the fact that in the womb, they had a secure base, that they were hearing um, kind and loving tones from mom and dad, even while being in the womb, that they, uh, as soon as they came, came out, that they were greeted with delight, that there was an 18 inch distance between eyes and a gazing at. And that gazing created a bond, created a secure attachment. Later, we find that a child who is securely attached, like I said, feels uh, like they can be independent, like they can explore while that caregiver is around. But then they always run for comfort to that caregiver. There are other forms of attachment that are insecure. And that's what I'll be doing my, um, my Facebook Live on or uh, next week. Uh, because I think there's some aha moments in here. Because what I want you to hear is the neural pathways that were developed in us early become the neural pathways that we ex access all of love through. Some of us have worked really hard in our marriages. We've worked really hard in other ways in order to develop strong attachments. Uh, so new ability to receive love has been created over time. I'm going to read in Anatomy of the Soul. Parents who are mindful of their children's needs and flexible in their interactions. Another thing, a strong thing that creates a secure attachment is the fact that a parent always answers when a child is truly in need. They're literally, these parents, mindful of their children's needs, are literally assisting the neural wiring process in their children's brains. This enables their children to be open and receptive to the image of a God who is interested and delighted in them, compassionate and full of grace when they stumble, yet willing to discipline them without simultaneously shaming. They will retain in their neural circuitry the imprint of a God who is there, a God of bone and blood, a God of strength, mercy, and mystery, a God of history acting in their lives. The proof being in, what they feel in a manner that is undeniable, rooted in their very bodies. So what we are hoping for, what Kurt Thompson and others teach us is that by these, by having repeatable connections with God, we can form an earned secure attachment with our Abba God. Without that loving presence, without that loving caregiver, 
A person's life on earth is untethered and they spend their life literally pinballing from comfort to comfort or being addicted to something as diabolical as a substance or seemingly insignificant as other people's approval. They are unrooted, desperately hungry for love. There's that quote. Parents who are mindful of their children's needs and flexible in their interactions with them are literally assisting the neural wiring process in their children's brains. So how they receive love and trust, trustful, trustworthiness, that creates a neural pathway to receive God's trustworthiness. I've spent a lot of time talking to adopted, uh, or parents who have adopted, and I'm hearing similar things from them about the processes that their children had to go through in order to receive that attachment to be safe and secure. So attachment is hard enough when there is a deep bond from birth. It's so much harder with a child who's been adopted. And we, my friends, have been adopted by our Abba Father. We shame ourselves when we forget to run to our Abba God for comfort, but we go familiar paths. But the truth is that we need um, a strong, strong experiences of attachment over time in order to develop that earned secure attachment and to know to know that we know that we know that we are loved. To know every single time that God is going to be standing, waiting on tiptoes for us to come home, that we are not going to be shamed. To know that he is delighted when we walk in the room. To know that his love does not get lessened in time, uh, we have questions, just like an adopted child has questions about whether love truly is unconditional, whether this person truly is trustworthy. This is what C.S. Lewis said, what is concrete but immaterial can be kept in view only by painful effort. And I would say to Clive Staples that, uh, that repetition changes the level of effort. That it wouldn't be painful effort if you did it over and over again a little at a time. I'm going to tell you a story that uh, changed all of this for me. When we were living in Maine, uh, we were living in townhouses. And one townhouse group was kind of butted up against another group, and we all shared the same green space. Well, Dr. Diger was getting his training at the same hospital where my dad was getting his training. And then someone at the end uh, was getting their training in veterinary medicine. Well, Dr. Dygert, even when they were living with us, had four or five children. But when they moved to Colorado, he and his wife decided to have two more children, to adopt two children from Russia. Now, this is in the 90s. And you remember the outcry of orphanages in uh, Romania and Russia and the way the children were treated. This is at the heart of this story. So these children were traumatized by their lack of touch. And when they came into Dr. Digert's house, they were creating absolute chaos. Two little girls around the ages of eight and nine. 
Well, Dr. Dygert reached into his attachment theory bag. And what he did was that he brought each girl onto his lap seven times a day, held them tightly, whispered to them who they were to him until they came to a place of rest. That rest built in that, their neural circuitry and in their nervous system, the fact that this was trustworthy, but it took time. It took being held close over and over until they could trust this man, that they could trust the words that he was speaking to them. And slowly their trauma was able to be healed. And that is the story behind this work, that we can be held by our loving God, that we receive the words from his scriptures, that we come to a place of rest, and so build that trust, build that sense of who we are as his beloved adopted children. I wonder if you have any questions. Uh, first, before we ask questions, I just, I wonder if you take a couple more deep breaths with me and just sit and soak with the truth that the Lord desires us to be able to rest to be still, to soak in his love. Now go ahead and take a couple deep breaths with your scripture. Once again, ask, Lord Jesus, would you show me how much you love me? I wonder um, what this has been like for you. How is this connected for you? Or maybe a better question would be, what are you going to take from our time today?
Danita says, when I move into student mode, furiously writing down all I can, it's so refreshing to move back to a breath prayer and slow down. Cheryl said, it resonates deeply. I'm going to take away a reminder not to feel ashamed when I find my emotions ping-ponging, but see it as an invitation to come back to the breath and to God. Oh my goodness, such a good word. So true. Deva says, I'll practice abiding and attaching more completely to my Abba Father. Thank you. Diane said, I was raised by my grandparents until I was two and a half and then thrown back to my parents in an abusive home. Wondering if I will really get over this. Breath prayer helps. I will take away, keep going back to God. Ginger said, it was very helpful for me. I've done a lot of healing myself, but I hope to use much of this to help my 21-year-old daughter who sugars whose sugars and anxiety uh, and a misplaced understanding of God, at least partly due to the problems with her dad, suffers. Yes, of course. Yes. This makes it very clear why I have so much pain related to attachment. I'm taking away a new hope in knowing the Lord's love more. Catherine said, the belief that I can come to rest in God's love throughout my days. Mm. As he said, I want to use a repeated daily reminders to come back to a place of rest for myself but also holding my adopted daughters close and whispering more to them. Oh, that's beautiful. I wonder if you can even see them as, um, I don't know if this is helpful, but small ex uh, extensions of yourself. If you can see yourself as being held by God in that moment, I wonder what that would be, would look like. Cheryl said, this just feels like such a safe place for so many tears. Oh, it's so good. And Josie said, actually, the Lord just did that when I asked him to show me how much he loves me. But yes, want to picture that more. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. Huh. I have a feeling that that's a really uh, beautiful place of, of promise from the Lord for you. To really lean into that, Josie, to really spend time with that. That's beautiful. You guys have any questions about this next couple weeks? Uh, any any wonderings about the presence project? Um, I want to leave room for those types of questions too. Cheryl said, I'm not sure how we should be feeding back our journaling to you. Um, if you want to, uh, you can just uh, type out like a half a page or that type of thing and then send it to my email, uh, which is mtrsummer at gmail.com. Uh, 
Otherwise, you can journal right into, um, right on the computer. I had uh, some easy ways to journal, which is you can journal straight into Facebook by um, answering the questions that are posed there, and that could be your journaling. You could journal through art. You could journal um, through some people, Instagram or blog. You could journal that way too, and just link it back to our Facebook group uh, in our weekly links on Fridays. Any other questions? You guys have been absolutely magnificent. It is such a privilege. And you can email your questions to me anytime. Um, and it is such a privilege to, to pray with you, to do this work with you. Thank you again for being willing to be a part of this pilot program. I, I really do believe that this is a work that more people need. And so uh, even though I love one-on-one -on -one and I love small groups, that's my absolute favorite. Um, this feels like something that, uh, that's for more people. And so I think uh, together our stories and our work will become a book. Uh, or become a course. I'm not quite sure, probably a book. And uh, anyways, thank you so much for, for journeying with me. I just know that the Spirit is going to be working in each one of our lives. And I want you to know that I am head cheerleader. I'm going to be learning to I'm going to be learning from you as well and being encouraged by how you are growing as well as um, I want you to know this is a safe place to battle it out, to wrestle, to come with your real self and, uh, and with the struggle. This is a safe place. Lane said, how lovely and profound today has been. You bring such encouragement from your own journey. Thank you for your vulnerable beauty. Thank you so much, Lane. It took me a long time, oh my, a long time to be able to be vulnerable. But I've learned over time that it's my vulnerability that gives space for other people to be vulnerable. And true relationship happens in vulnerability, true learning, true growth. And Josie said, thank you so much for you and the ladies for sharing. Yeah, thank you everyone for your willingness to be a part of the chat. Um, it was so lovely. And Diva said, planning to buy candles and begin using that as a trigger to live in his presence. Uh, that she was given a clinging cross. Uh, before her husband had a very lengthy surgery recently and a great reminder of his presence. Thank you, Summer, and the participants. And Ginger said, this has been a wonderful group. I can't wait to spend the year with you all. Me too. This is just absolutely beautiful, uh, stunning even, that this kind of beauty can happen over chat spaces and over Zoom. I'm just so proud of you guys for entering in and for the hunger that you come with, the vulnerability that you come with. It's absolutely beautiful. I'll see you on Facebook. I'll see you on, um, on the 7th. And if uh, you want to come to our spontaneous uh, retreat, uh, the February 8th through 10th, let me know with that same email. Uh, blessings to you on your day, and why don't I pray for us and for you. Lord Jesus Christ, you are so good to us. Why do we doubt you? Why do we doubt that you have set a table in the wilderness? Why do we doubt that there will always be bread? Continue to teach us. 
to turn our eyes towards you. Continue to reveal yourself to us. I pray that you would seal this work that you've done in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit on each one of these people. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessings, dear friends. See you soon.